Hey, what's up everyone? Today I have a special episode for you. Now, if you haven't been checking me out online, I have been doing a lot of podcasts lately. I've been extremely lucky to have multiple people on my podcast that I could have only I guess dreamed of talking to but this person is one of the first people that I reached out to to talk to for a number of reasons number one he was one of the first people to kind of help me start to really understand my purpose in the classroom and what that looks like and Cornelius Minor was one of those people I'm like um thank you for having me on the podcast Gary this is incredible I'm so excited um, my name is Cornelius Minor I am a Brooklyn based educator taught seventh grade um, in Brooklyn's mighty mighty district 15 um, so I'm a New York City guy, but for the last few years, I have been at the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project at Columbia University. Um, and there I am responsible for supporting schools all over the world. I develop middle school literacy curriculum and work with an incredible team of people to make sure that kids all over the planet do incredible literacy stuff. So that's really um, me. In this episode, I'm going to go through a number of clips where I talk to Cornelius about specific things within his life and within education and I'm gonna actually have a chance to kind of respond and react to some of the things he said in a more constructed setting um, if you are interested in the entire podcast I did put the link below but until then let's get into it here's a first clip from Cornelius you know that's what I've always been about yeah. yeah just that idea that like you know even as a teacher you know um and it's kind of funny because you know people always like oh you know like teaching 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 but you know even to this day i contend that like i'm not like the best teacher mm -hmm. um you know when it comes to reading and writing but like i do believe that there are very few people who can sling books better than i can you know and that became you know my calling card you know the kids would come from all over the school even kids that weren't in seventh grade they would come to my classroom and be like yo i heard you got them books and i'm like yup you know and so <laughs> and really like that became the thing that i was proudest of you know and i was really proud of my ability to meet any kid listen to them and then after listening to them and spending time with them for a while be able to recommend books for them and you know so i would put together like whole courses of study for kids so kids would come and spend like you know 15 minutes talking to me and i'd be like all right i got you we're gonna start with this one but then after you read this one you gotta read this one because that's gonna uh -huh. help you out with this but then you're gonna read this one because you love dragons and then uh -huh. after this like you got to get up off those dragons because you got to get into robots and so then you gotta read this <laughs> and so kids would leave the room with like you know 15 books on deck to read uh -huh. um and there's nothing that excites me more than doing that work you know uh -huh. that that's like where it's at the power of one of the things i love about cornelius's clip and how he talks about slinging books is that he is always prepared to give books and put that correct book in the student's hands when they come into the classroom. The power of a student interest can take you on a magical journey as a student and as an educator. It can open up doorways to students and reading and writing and just a love for learning. And it seems like Cornelius has figured that out. In the next clip, we talked to Cornelius about raising two girls um, and specifically just raising humans in general. You know, it's beautiful. I think, I mean, I mean, I, I know what I don't know. You know, I was really lucky, you know, because I'm an educator um, and I get the, the flexible yearly schedule. I was really lucky to be able to stay home with my daughter um, mm -hmm. when she was born. And so when my partner, when she went back to work, um, I was at home with the kid. And, 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 and it was our first daughter. So with our first daughter, I'm at home with her. Um, and, you know, and we're walking around Brooklyn, just like I'm introducing her to things. So, you know, we're, you know, and, and she's, I remember she used to cry all the time unless we were walking. And so I would put her in the baby carrier and I would leave my house and I would just start walking. And so my oldest daughter has seen every square like centimeter wow. of Brooklyn. Wow. Um, just because I spent her first like few months of life just walking all over the place. And um and and I think what is it like to raise girls? Like um I, I don't know if I can answer that question, mm -hmm. but but what it's like to be a human in charge of other humans, mm -hmm. um, in charge of their everything, in charge mm -hmm. of their food, in charge of their poop, in charge of their clothes. Um that has been like really like um really cool, 
Like, I think it's been, it's the best class that I've ever taken, you know, that they continue to teach me things. Again, I remember even at that early age, you know, walking around Brooklyn, I remember um, I would just like put all their bottles in this cooler, like, you know, like my wife would pump. And so I would have like these like containers of breast milk frozen and I would have a cooler in my backpack. And then I would just like take off and I don't own a car. So my daughter and I would just like walk around Brooklyn all day and she would nap in the baby carrier on me and then she'd wake up and need food. So I'd have to look around and be like, all right, am I near a hotel? And I would duck into a hotel lobby and like feed her. Um, and so I just remember like, studying her cues and like the way that she would move or the way she would make sounds um okay this sound means she's about to get up or this the way that she's moving means that she's tired of like walking and she wants to rest a little bit or the way that she does this means that she's hot or means that she's too cold or means that she needs a hat and so really intensely studying a human and all of the ways that they're communicating because this human is not verbal and then i'm able to bring all of that into my work as a teacher all of that into my work you know with other teachers because like that really taught me okay somebody might not say anything but they might move in a specific way that communicates that they need something mm -hmm. or somebody might not you know say anything but they might like you know hunch over in a way that communicates that they're uncomfortable mm -hmm. and i've got to respond to all of those things mm -hmm. you know and so i think you know what it's like to to raise girls or what it's like to raise kids i think that has meant you know it's it, it it's a lesson in perception for mm -hmm. me Mm -hmm. that I've had to like learn to be more perceptive mm -hmm. um, and it's a lesson in sacrificing one's own desires um, for for the for the greater like communal good you mm -hmm. know and I think you know being a dad is like yo I just ordered some french fries and I'm trying to eat my french fries and my kids are all up in my plate and I'm like yeah so I can't get no french fries today you know <laughs> and um but 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 I think that that's so symbolic you're like all right so I'm sacrificing half my french fries for the communal good um but, you know, and, and then learning what that means as an educator um, mm -hmm. and how then you learn that sacrifice pays you back, mm -hmm. you know, so you give half your French fries to your kid and then, you know, and then she sits on your lap and you read stories together. And so mm -hmm. you're like, crap, I don't have my French fries, but then I had this beautiful moment with my daughter to read uh -huh. the story. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, that's been like a really cool thing. Um, mm -hmm. And then you have these humans that like experience life as you experience it, you know, and they learn the things that you learn, mm -hmm. um, you know, that like my, you know, my daughter knows every like lyric for all the dopest hip hop songs in the 90s. <laughs> and I just think that's cool, you know, that we spent the time together and she's learned all these songs, you know, like um, my um, my oldest, the two of us, um, I just got um, the Lego Voltron kit. Uh -huh. um, and we're uh -huh. building that, you know, and so it's wow. like a 2,500 piece Lego kit. And, you know, and she, you know, Voltron is from the 80s, you know, she don't even know about Voltron. But uh -huh. We're building that kit together. There and wow. All of those things, man. Like, it's just like really like fun, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Cornelius is always learning. One of the things I noticed about him and what he's doing online and in just in the ed educational world in general, he takes absolutely every experience and he learns from it. He talks about how learning to raise humans was one of the best classes that he's ever taken. And I think that's amazing. He is always a student of learning. He takes this experience and he quickly applies it to the classroom. He talks about how teachers and educators can learn how to respond better to students and take perspectives to help students understand that we are listening, that we are hearing them, that we are seeing them in the classroom. I love the moment where he talks about how sacrifice pays off. In this next clip, Cornelius talks about how the world is not ready for us. The world ain't ready for us. You know, the world hasn't been ready for us ever. You know, the world wasn't ready for me as a black kid growing up in the 80s. You know, the world wasn't ready for you. Um, the world wasn't ready for my partner mm -hmm. as, a, as a really fierce and independent woman growing up in the 80s, you know? And so one of the things that I'm always thinking about is how do we construct the systems that can accommodate and, 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 and nurture our kids no matter who they are? You know, that when we think about sexism, racism, classism, one of the things that I've continued to say in all of my scholarship is that that when we often kind of conflate things like racism or sexism or classism or ableism and we say we, we talk about these things as if they are personality traits mm -hmm. and you know we're, we're that person over there is sexist or that person over there is racist um and and one of the things that i've always contended is like that that racism classism sexism these things are not merely personality traits this is not about personal niceness being nice to people is not going to eradicate racism mm -hmm. being nice to people is not going to eradicate sexism 
system. You know that these things are systems. You know that these are the rules, the practices, the policies, the procedures, the customs that lead to unequal outcomes for specific subsets of people. You know, and so when I think about my daughters, there are systems in place that are designed to, you know, to make sure that that women are marginalized. You know, there are systems in place designed to make sure that people of color are marginalized. You know, we talk about you know, in the United States about the gender pay gap, you know, that is a form of sexism. And that form of sexism does not exist because people are mean. That form of sexism exists because there are rules and policies and customs in place that ensure that women don't make the same as men. And so when I want to topple a system of sexism, it's not just about being nicer. It's about identifying the things in workplaces and governmental systems and tax structures that, that keep certain people, women in this example, from making what their male counterparts make. And so when I'm, you know, when I think about my own daughters, I think about all of those things. And, and that's why my work is so heavily invested in dismantling and disrupting the systems that marginalize people. Not just because it's going to benefit my kids, but because it's going to benefit all of us. You know, the more people that have access, the better off we all are, mm -hmm. you know, and so that we've gotten used to certain people not having access and others having all the access is a really perverted way to move through the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so Similar to what I talked about before, one of the reasons why I feel the work that Cornelius is doing is so valuable is because he doesn't just talk about the little things or the fluffy things or the things that are pretty or what he would say is nice. He talks about really disrupting systems, systems that lead to unequal representation, unequal learning opportunities, unequal jobs, unequal rights, and how we can help students disrupt those systems while they're in the classroom. He talks about how some of these systems lead to unequal outcomes and how the more people who have access, the better we all are as a human race. Cornelius just nails this podcast with the questions and the comments that he's making. It gives me energy just listening to him respond and share his knowledge on education. I am super excited to continue this conversation online. So if you have a comment, please comment below. You can send me a message on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. I am consistently learning and trying to understand ways to help best um, educate my kids and talk about this with my colleagues. So send me a message, send me a post. Until next time, stay in the gray area. I'm out. <laughs>